welcome everyone to the final week of my teaching series, The Good Fight. And I cannot believe that this is our last week together. And I just want to say thank you to all of you women who've gone on this journey with me. I know we've all learned so much about fighting the battles that matter to God. And what I love about God's Word is that it speaks to us today. It's relevant, it's alive, it's active, and it's applicable to our lives and to our circumstances. And I think we've all found that to be true in this study. Well, the theme verse for this series is 1 Timothy 6.12, where the Apostle Paul tells us to fight the good fight of the faith, to take hold of the eternal life to which we were called. Paul's saying there is a good fight of faith, and we want to be in it. We don't want to be in the silly fights. We don't want to get in the stupid fights or engage in the ugly fights. We want to be in the good fight. God calls us to something bigger. He wants to come into our ordinary world and open our eyes to his divine kingdom purposes. And we all have one. And there are times in the battles that we face that we feel small, we feel invisible, we feel discouraged, we might feel hopeless. But I want to remind you today that you are destined for greatness. That God has a fight marked out for your life. And in that battle, God is with you. He is for you. He has plans for you. And he has victory for you. God reminded me of a Bible story as I was preparing my notes today. And it's found in 2 Kings chapter 6. And in this story, Israel is being attacked by an enemy army. And the king sent a servant out and said, go scope out the territory. Go see what the enemy looks like. And the servant went out and he felt intimidated. He felt small and powerless in the presence of this enemy. And Elijah the prophet was there. And he said to the servant, he prayed, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And when the servant looked, he saw hills full of horses and chariots and fire. God was showing this servant, and he's showing us that there's a supernatural realm all around us that we can't see, but it's real. We are surrounded by the armies of the living God. And God struck this army blind, the enemy army blind, and he gave his people victory. He's letting us know heaven is on our side. Heaven is cheering us on. We matter to God. Our stories, they matter to God. So if you're feeling discouraged today, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't walk away from the battle. God is at work behind the scenes, and he has victory for you. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 33, 16 through 20. He says, no king succeeds with a big army alone, and no warrior wins by brute strength. Horsepower is not the answer. No one gets by on muscle alone. He's saying we can't wing it in our own strength. We can't fight the battles in our own strength. He goes on to say, God's eye is on those who respect him, the ones who are looking for his love. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. And in lean times, he keeps the body and the soul together. When we're depending on God, he's everything that we need. I love that. The psalmist is saying the key to victory in the battles that we face is to trust on God, to depend on him, and he'll give us everything we need. He's our strength. He's our joy. He's our peace. He empowers us, and he gives us hope in the battle. When we trust God and depend on his strength, he will give us victory. We talked a lot about trust last week as we studied the many battles that Mary, the mother of Jesus, faced in the Bible. So I'm so excited to continue my teaching today talking about this woman warrior who is infamous both in the Bible and in our world today. I divided my teaching on Mary into two weeks because I simply could not fit her story into one week. It's so layered and it's so powerful. We covered a portion of her story last week. We're going to continue learning from her today. And I can't wait to dive in because we learned so much from her in every season of her life and every battle that she faced in the good fight that God called her to. And what's so special about Mary and her calling is that she not only knew Jesus as Lord, but she knew Jesus as her son. She was his mother. No one ever has had or ever will have this unique relationship that Mary had with Jesus. This calling was specific to her. And just like Mary had a specific calling on her life, we all have divine callings on our life. In the good fight of faith, God has given us a people to fight for. He has divinely placed us in our sphere of influence for a purpose. And he's given us callings to fulfill. There are divine assignments meant for us that only we can fulfill. And he's given us battles to win because the enemy's going to come against us. He has influence here. And he wants nothing more than to stop the purposes of God. 
But with God's help, when we depend on him, we can overcome his schemes. He's a personal God, and he has a fight marked out for us. Mary trusted God, and she trusted in his plans for her life, even when it was hard. And she wasn't looking to be famous. She wasn't looking to be known, but God interrupted her ordinary world, and he called her to something more. And he does this with us. So I want to briefly review God calling Mary into the good fight. We talked about this part of her story last week, so it'll be a little bit of a review for some of you. But the angel Gabriel came to Mary as a young maiden when she was only around 14 years old. And he said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And then Gabriel tells Mary her assignment. He says, you will conceive and you will give birth to a son and he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High, and his kingdom will never end. And then Gabriel tells her how this is going to come about. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One born to you will be called the Son of God. Mary takes this in, and as she so often does, she ponders this in her heart. She understands she's going to have a supernatural pregnancy. She understands that the plans as she knew them were going to be interrupted. And she doesn't know the whole picture. But she responds to God saying, I am your servant. Let it be as you say. She chooses to trust God and trust in his plans. And I read something that Nikki Gumbel, who is a preacher out of London that I greatly respect, I read something that he said about Mary and I just found it fascinating. So I want to share it with you today. He said, Mary is a picture of a New Testament believer. The Bible tells us that God is with Mary, that God is within Mary, and that God is over Mary. So I want to unpack that. God is with Mary. Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, the Lord is with you. And God is within Mary because she is literally going to carry the Son of God in her womb as his mother. And God is over her because she submits to his plans and she says, I am your servant. Let it be as you say. She puts herself under the authority of God. He's with her. He's in her. He's over her. I want to draw a parallel between Mary and us as New Testament believers today. Jesus is with us. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says to his disciples as he's ascending into heaven, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is in us. Through the indwelling of his spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Bible says we are the temple of the Lord. And his spirit dwells in us. As Jesus was preparing his disciples for the new covenant, for the coming spirit, he said, listen, it's better if I go away. Because if I go away, I'm going to send my helper to you. I'm going to send my spirit. And he won't just be with you. He will be in you. This was the new covenant. This is revolutionary. And Jesus is over us when we, like Mary... Say, let it be as you say. I am your servant. When we put ourselves under God's authority, he's with us. He's in us. He's over us. Do you see this picture? We all can have a similar connection to Mary. She represents the new covenant that Jesus came to bring. Just like Mary, we have access to God with us, in us, and over us in the good fight of faith. God is a personal God, and he wants to do life with us. He wants intimacy with us. So this picture stuck out to me. I just thought it was fascinating. Well, last week, we unpacked two battles that Mary faced, the battle of the call. This is her being called into this assignment and all the battles that came with it. And the battle of the birth, this involved Jesus being born, her raising him as a toddler, her raising him as a teenager. And today we're going to pick up there and we're going to examine the battle of Jesus' mission. This involves Jesus entering into his earthly ministry, into adulthood, and we're going to see the battle Mary faces as he transitions from not only being her son, but to being her king. So as we begin, I want to hit on something I said last week. As we study Mary, we are going to examine what the Bible says about her. There are so many theories, there are so many stories about who she is, but we want to know what God wants us to know. We want to see what God's word says. So we're going to look at the interactions between Jesus and Mary, the conversations, and we're going to see what we can learn from the battle she faces in this season. But I want to begin telling you a personal story. My son Barrett and my oldest daughter Sloan recently got their wisdom teeth out. And you know when they get their wisdom teeth out, they wake up and they're just completely loopy. 
I mean, they, you, they are, their eyes are glazed over and they say the funniest things. So I was waiting for them to wake up and I went in the little waiting room and Barrett kept trying to say something to me. And I was like, Barrett, I can't understand you. And you know, his eyes are wild. So I took out the gauze out of his mouth and I said, what are you saying? And he said, Mom, I saw God. And I said, what'd you say? He goes, I saw God. God. I mean, his eyes are just like so glazed over. And I thought, well, I'm going to entertain this. I said, well, what do you look like? And he said, well, he was a huge figure of light. And there was an army going on between the good and the evil. And there was a battle. And, and the good was, was overtaking the evil. And there was a stairway for, to heaven. I mean, he went on and on. And I was like, this is amazing. And, and the funny thing is, is even when he came to, he stuck with the story. He said, no, I saw him. I saw God. And I thought, well, how amazing. I kind of believe him. You know, it could have been the medicine talking, but I think he saw God. I think he had a vision. But I tell you this because as we're entering into Mary's story today, as we're going to walk with her in these interactions with Jesus, we're going to see over and over her seeing glimpses of God. And she doesn't say it verbally, but, but we're knowing that what, as we're on this journey with her, I think she's thinking, I saw God. I mean, yes, he's my son. Yes, I've raised him, but no, 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 I saw him. I saw God. And we're going to see that play out. And really, in the Christian faith, in the good fight that we're all entering into with God, over and over and over, we see God. He's a personal God. So there are those moments that, that in this great adventure we can go, no, 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 I saw God for my life. I saw his hand of provision. I saw his miracles. I saw his confirmation. I saw his strength in that battle when I had nothing else. I, I can look back in my life and I can say, no, I saw him. I saw him. And we're going to see this play out today between Jesus and Mary as we begin with Jesus' first miracle. And I want to set up the context of what's going on in this story. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's 30 years old, and he's been baptized at the Jordan River by his cousin John the Baptist. Last week we talked about John the Baptist. He was born to Elizabeth, Mary's aunt, in her old age, it was a supernatural pregnancy, and his role is to prepare the way for the Lord. And we see this happening here. He baptizes Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove, and God's voice speaks out from the heavens, this is my son, whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. God testifies, Jesus is his son. This is recorded in all four of the Gospels, and this major event marks the beginning of Jesus' public earthly ministry. Jesus goes in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights where he's tested. He overcomes this battle against the enemy, and he begins calling his disciples. So we are at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 2, Jesus goes to his first event, and it's a wedding. John chapter 2, verse 1 says, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So I want to pause here. A wedding at this period in Jewish culture, it's a huge event. It's not just a one-day event like weddings in our day. It lasted for a week. The celebration lasted for days. And the kingdom of God all throughout the Bible is often compared to a Jewish wedding feast. It's a joyous, wonderful celebration. Jesus is invited to this wedding. His mother's there. And the Bible tells us in John 2.12, his brothers are also there. So we can assume that the entire family is invited. Could have been a family member getting married. It could have been just someone who was close friends with him in his community. At this point, Jesus has performed no miracles. His disciples are newly following him. They're men from different parts of society. They're fishermen. They're tax collectors. They didn't grow up with Jesus. So we know his mother and his brothers are going, hmm, who's he bringing here? I mean, he has followers now. He's attracting followers. Something is stirring. He's transitioning into a new role. He's in full-on ministry. And it's significant he comes on the third day. The third day in the Bible represents resurrection and it represents new life. You see this symbolized all throughout the Bible. So it's meaningful. Jesus comes to this wedding in resurrection form. He is full-on coming as Savior, as King, as Lord, and as Messiah. And at this point, he is answering completely to God the Father. And from this point on, he is going to attract a variety of relationships. His circle is going to greatly widen. He is in a teaching, an authoritative role, and he's going to be drawing all different groups of people. So this is a new normal for his family. So with this in mind, we're going to zoom in on a pivotal conversation between Jesus and Mary at this wedding. The Bible says in John 3, 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, Jesus... 
they have no more wine. It's not a question, just a statement. But something's implied here. When we have company, and I don't really want to boss Reese too much, my husband, but I kind of need him to do something, I might say something like, hey, Reese, the trash is full. And if he doesn't really listen to me and he keeps on going, I'll go, Reese, the trash is full. I'm implying, go take it out. Go do something about it. It's kind of my way of bossing him. This is what Mary's doing. Jesus, they have no more wine. She's letting him know, do something. And see, this is a big deal in this culture at a wedding to run out of wine. It's a major party foul. It's not just, oh, that's inconvenient. No, 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 no. This would bring shame on the family. It would be breaking hospitality laws. It would dishonor the host. Mary is letting Jesus know this is a crisis. And she's implying, do something about it. She's asking him to perform a miracle. I mean, how is he going to just come up with wine out of nowhere? She has full confidence in Jesus. She knows he can. She has faith in him. She knows something's stirring. He's brought disciples. Something's happening. It's kind of like if you knew your son was Superman. And as an adult, you're going, okay, okay, fly. Show your power. Show people who you are. She's going, it's time. He has disciples. Do something about this. She's asking him to show his power, prompting him to act. There's more in this statement than meets the eye. And Jesus responds in an interesting way because he knows what she's asking. He said, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And he's saying, my hour to show myself publicly as Messiah has not yet come. And he's sending some other messages here. I want to unpack those. He calls her woman. He doesn't call her mother. And we don't want to get bent out of shape about that. That's not a term of disrespect. That's a term of reverence. It's like saying maiden or lady or ma'am. But he doesn't call her mom. So he's letting her know, you're not my primary authority anymore. And he understands that she's asking him to create wine, to perform a miracle. She isn't asking him to help with the dishes or carry some heavy boxes. This is a big ask. And he's letting her know, I have to hear from God. God alone on this matter. In John 5.30, Jesus says, I myself can do nothing. I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. This is his Father's call. And public miracles were going to come. There was a time for that. But Jesus was going to be prompted by God to show his power. He said, my hour hasn't come. And there's a battle here. Because Mary is having to let go of control and trust in God's timing and trust Jesus in his messianic role. And she understands what's going on. And she understands what Jesus is saying. And the Bible says in verse 5, Mary says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he says. This statement is similar language to her words in the beginning. When God called her into ministry. Let it be as you say. She's going, let it be as he says. It's a similar posture. She becomes subservient to Jesus in this moment. She understood he could do the miracle, but it's going to be on his timing, not hers. And this conversation sets the tone for his ministry and Mary's role in it. She is now in a supporting role. How does this apply to us in the good fight of faith as mothers and as Christ followers? Well, as mothers, we're always our children's mother, but our roles are constantly changing. In different seasons, we play different roles. And I had to learn this when my oldest son, Barrett, turned 13. And now my other kids, I have so many stories on him because he's my firstborn. But I, I didn't get it with him. But now I kind of know what to look for with my other kids. But when Barrett first turned 13, I knew something shifted. The role had changed. I went up to the middle school one day, and he had flag football practice after school. And he had jeans on because they have a dress code. So I brought a, his shorts in a little baggie. And I brought a little bag of pretzels. And I had water with his name on it. And I go up to the middle school. And it's a hustling, bustling time of the day. All the teachers are out and the kids are all out. Here comes Barrett around the corner with a pack of friends. And I thought, oh, there's Barrett. I said, Barrett, Barrett, I got your shorts. And I got your pretzels. And I got your water. Come here, you have flag football practice. And he looked horrified. And it's the first time he really snubbed me. He goes, get out of here. Get, get out of here. He's doing his arm. And I go, oh. I go, well, no, you're, you can't practice in your jeans. It's not underwear. Short. So come, come on over here. He goes, get out of here. And he just walked off. So in a panic, to save face, I grabbed his buddy, Cal, one of his best friends. I said, Cal, come here. I don't know what's wrong with Barry. I go, here's his shorts and here's his pretzels. And Cal was panicked. And mom was on their turf. And he goes, we don't want your pretzels. And I go, oh. And, and he walked away. And, and I, I just walked out of the middle school with my tail between my legs. I was embarrassed. And it was the first time Barrett kind of set this boundary with me. And I remember I just got in my car and I started crying. 
I was like, something's changed. The role has changed. I had to relinquish control. And that's hard for us as moms. But I knew something shifted. I mean, Boone still holds my hand. He's 11 years old. But I know it's going to change. So I cherish it. And it's okay that it changes. It's healthy. But our roles as moms are always changing. And I don't have adult children. But I know that role changes. Your kids get married. When Reese and I got married, all the traditions changed. I mean, my mother-in-law and my mom were so flexible. And I'm thankful for that because I have friends that they're hitting heads with everyone in the family because now it's her, you and your husband deciding what you're going to do on the holidays. And you have to see the different roles. And as Christ followers, we're always changing our roles in the kingdom of God. I mean, he's always moving us and growing us and teaching us. Sometimes we're getting mentored. Sometimes he's going, now I want you to mentor. I mean, sometimes we're serving. And God's going, now I want you to step up and lead. Now I want you to be patient. Now I want you to act. Now I want you to pray about this. Now I want you to speak up. I mean, we have to be flexible. Mary is wise. When Jesus sets a boundary, she doesn't get mad. She doesn't punish him and give him the silent treatment the rest of the wedding. She doesn't take it personal. She doesn't fight him. She accepts it. Wisdom involves accepting boundaries and embracing our new roles. And they're always changing. So what happens next? I'm going to tell you the story. There are six stone water jars. And Jesus commands the servants to fill them to the brim. And then Jesus turns the water into wine, and not just any wine, the best wine. And only the disciples and the servants and Mary knew what was happening. This wasn't a public miracle. It was a private miracle. The guests and the host, they had no idea. In John 2.10, the Bible says the head waiter says to the groom, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then after all the people are drunk, then the inferior, but you... You've kept the fine wine until now. I mean, it elevated the host. He covered their shame. He rescued them from embarrassment. Jesus saved the party. This is his first miracle. And turning water into wine is a picture of what Jesus came to bring. Wine represents gladness of heart, joy, celebration, and new wine is a metaphor of the Holy Spirit. God wants to fill us to the brim of his, with his spirit. This is the good news. He came to cover our shame and to give us joy, and make all things new. And this is such a layered miracle. We could spend weeks on it. But I want to focus on Mary. And I don't want us to miss the fact that Jesus does end up doing what his mother asked him to do. And he blessed her abundantly. But before he performed the miracle, he had to set the boundary. It's always about God's will. And Mary understood it. Do whatever he tells you. And I also want to point out that Jesus does hear her request, and he hears our request. Our prayers matter. Our prayers do make a difference. Jesus did show his power. He loved his mother. He loved these people. He doesn't want them to have shame. But he answered her request in a way that honors God first. Jesus shows us in these conversations how this faith thing works. He wants us to pray. He wants us to invite him into our circumstances, into our lives. He's a relational God. He says, seek me, ask of me, present your request to me. But then like Mary, trust me, trust in his timing. He is going to work it all out for good more than we could ask or ever think. We've got to trust him. And that leads me to the first point. God is in control. And the good fight involves praying to God and submitting to his will. The good fight involves praying to God in surrendering to his will. Mary wisely shows us how to surrender to Jesus and his timing. So now we're going to look at another interaction between Jesus and Mary found in Mark chapter 3. And in this story, Mary gets pulled into the wrong battle. And I love this because she's human, just like us. And I'm going to include it because it's in here. Mary got pulled into some family drama. And we as women understand family drama. We all have sisters and brothers and husbands and daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws and extended family and children. And it's easy to get roped in, especially the moms. I mean, we get the brunt of it. We hear everybody's side. Moms hold a lot of power in the family. Mark chapter 3, Jesus' brothers are getting their mom all stirred up. And I'm going to give you some context. At this point, Jesus is now in the thick of ministry. He's doing miracles publicly. He's gaining popularity, but he's also starting to ruffle feathers. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the law, are threatened by Jesus because he challenges them. He challenges their authority, their motives, their laws, their legalism, and rightly so. They're oppressing people. They're using religion as a means of control. They're self-righteous and they're cruel. And Jesus calls them out. And he exposes their hypocrisy. And they want Jesus to lose credibility. And Jesus is gaining popularity with the oppressed 
with the sick, with the outcasts. They're kept out of religious circles. They're rejected from the religious society in that day. They're desperate to get to Jesus because he brings hope and he brings healing and he welcomes them. And there's so much need and there's so much suffering that Jesus and his disciples at this point are working nonstop. Everywhere they go, people are mobbing them. And his brothers, his earthly brothers at this time, they don't believe he's the Messiah. They don't believe until after the resurrection. So at this point, you know, they're going, what is he doing? He's nuts. He's telling everybody he's the Messiah. I mean, he's taking ministry way too far. They don't believe him, and they think he's gone crazy. In Matthew 13, 57, Jesus says, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and in his own household. He experienced this firsthand. His brothers and his sisters think he's gone crazy. I heard Kristen Wiig, a funny comedian that we all know and love, um, I heard her being interviewed, and I just thought it was so fascinating. She said she sat her family down when she kind of was starting to get famous, and she signed some big picture movie deals, and she was going to be on Saturday Night Live and host things and do all sorts of stuff. She said she was kind of warning her family. She goes, you know, I'm, you know doors are opening for me in the comedian world, and I'm, I may be famous. And she said her family looked at her, and they said, so people think you're funny? And she said, yes, I'm funny. And they said, they do? You're funny? And she said, I am hilarious. I am funny. But it's like they didn't even recognize it, her own family members. And so it just made me think we have to be careful. Because when we know people so well, sometimes we don't see God's potential in them. We don't see what God's calling them to do. We're going, we just know them so well. They can't, they can't do that. And I just thought that was interesting. Okay, so Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. The Bible says Jesus entered a house and again... A crowd gathered, so much so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. I mean, they, they can't even eat a meal. They're, they're just meeting needs, and there's so much going on, and so many people are wanting a piece of them. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. Another version says they went to restrain him, for they said, he's out of his mind. So they think he's lost it. They think he's making a fool of themselves, and they're just kind of fed up. And I want us to look at it from his family's perspective. So there's three things that, that are, they're concerned about. First of all, he's now making enemies of powerful people. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, he's challenging them, and they're angry. So his family knows, I mean, this, this isn't good, Jesus. You don't want to make these people mad. They could hurt you. I mean, this is serious stuff. So they're concerned for his well-being and his community. I mean, Mary knew he was, was a savior, a messiah, but she didn't know how this thing was going to play out. She's going, I don't know if you want to ruffle their feathers. And, and, he's, and they're concerned because he's literally working himself to death. I mean, there's so much need. There's so much suffering. He's not eating. And you know, as a mother, that's a big trigger. I mean, you know, Mary's going, well, I mean, he has lost weight. I mean, there's circles under his eyes. I mean, I just don't know if he's eating enough. I just think he's, he's working himself too much. That's a big trigger for us moms. We want to make sure our kids are okay. And they also think he's losing his mind. And his brothers are going, you know, now he's ruining our family's reputation. He's making us look foolish. This is affecting us. Mom, we got to do something. And I feel sorry for Mary because his brothers are going, you're the only one who can talk to him. I mean, you're the mom. you got to go help us do something. I mean, they're getting her all stirred up. And as mama bears, that mama bear instinct kicks in. And you know how we do. We go, we're going to go take charge. We're going to go get that teenager. We're going to get her out of that party. I mean, we're going to take charge. And we had a situation last weekend at OU Texas, where I saw about six mama bears get in that take charge mode. So my husband always gets a room at a restaurant after OU Texas. It's a tradition our family goes. And he got a room at an Italian place. And we're all in there eating dinner. We're in the middle of our dinner enjoying ourselves. And there's a fraternity sorority party going on in the same restaurant kind of outside of our room. And about in the middle of our dinner, this young girl comes stumbling in to our room in a little little dress and her hair's pulled up and she was obviously at that party and she's completely drunk. I mean, she doesn't know where she is, but she's trying to get out of there because she's going to vomit. And she starts, she starts heaving and about six of us moms jump up off the table. She goes to one table. It was like a movie. And she's about to throw up on the food at this table. And then we get her around this other table and she's about to throw up at this table. And my husband had rented the patio. So we get her outside and she projectile vomits all over the patio. I mean, one mom grabs her hair, another mom gets a bucket, another mom is calling Uber, going, okay, well, who's her, getting her friends going, we gotta get this girl home. And then one of my friends got in her face and goes, what are you thinking? This is out of control. I mean, she's lecturing her. I'm like, she doesn't know what you're saying. I mean, it was a disaster. And about that same time, the waiter comes out and he goes, now, do y'all want any more sausage, pepperoni, pizza? We go, get out of here. Well, no one's hungry. We're taking care of this girl. But we had to take charge. So that's kind of what's happening here. So the Bible says, Jesus' mother 
and brothers arrive. And they're standing outside the house. And they send someone in to call Jesus. And a crowd was sitting around Jesus. And the crowd said, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside looking for you. I mean, it's an intervention. And Jesus said something interesting in verse 33. He said, who are my mother and who are my brothers? Then he looked around at those seated in a circle and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. It's a powerful thing. He's setting a strong boundary here. He doesn't go out to them. He's sending a message, I will not be rescued from my mission. I will not be deterred. It doesn't matter who's calling me. It's kind of a slap on the hand. And he's reminding his mother, this is why I came. And nothing's going to distract me from my purpose. And we see a similar exchange between Jesus and Peter. And Peter, um, at one point in Jesus' ministry, when Jesus is explaining to his disciples that he's going to have to die, Peter rebukes Jesus and says, no, Lord, you can't die. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He says, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. He's going, nothing will get in the way of my mission. Listen, Jesus has no problem setting boundaries. He's not a people pleaser. But I also heard something else in this story in my research that I thought was fascinating. So Jesus is doing something else here. There's another message. He is defining how the family of God works. He's saying there's no entitlement when it comes to me. If you follow me, you're my mother, you're my brother, you're my sister. There's no favoritism in the body of Christ. I love that. He loves us all equally. He loves us uniquely, but he loves us equally. And he's empowering those people listening to him. They were rejected. They didn't belong anywhere. They weren't included. They were excluded. And he's going, listen, you're my inner circle. I know your name. You're like my sister. You're like my mother. You're like my brother. I love you just as much as I love them. He's empowering them. He's not diminishing our families. Of course family is important. But he's saying, in the body of Christ, we're equal. He loves all of us. There's no favoritism. There's no entitlement. Anybody who does his will belongs to him. And I find comfort that we're all in the inner circle. That he just loves all of us, just like family. I love that. We matter to him. So he's saying, everyone here is my family. Everyone who follows me. And he's also saying, I'm not going to be deterred from my mission. So what does Mary take away here? Her role, she's reminded, that her role is to encourage Jesus to do the will of God the Father, not rescue him from his mission. And it sends a message to us. We want to be encouragers of people who are doing the will of God. We don't want to discourage people. Maybe you have a friend called the foster, and you're going, oh, Mike, you can't do that. I mean, that's going to affect your kids, and you're going to be so busy, and you're going to be so tired. Or maybe they're called the prison ministry. And you're going, you don't want to go in that part of town. I mean, it's dangerous. Because maybe you're really concerned about their well-being. But we got to be careful. We don't want to rescue people from their mission that God has sent them on. This is why we're here. We're here to make a difference. And it is a fight. And it is messy. And it's not always perfect. So, so we got to be graceful in that way. And it's okay to take charge sometimes. And it's okay to offer wisdom. But we want to be asking God, am I helping or am I interfering? Show me, Lord. Show me. We want to be asking God. Jesus let Mary know, in this case, Mom, you're interfering. Second point, fighting the good fight involves supporting people as they seek the will of God. Fighting the good fight involves supporting people as they seek the will of God. We want to be encouraging to people in God's will. So we're going to examine the final battle that Mary will face. And this is the toughest, hardest, most gruesome battle that she's faced yet. And last week, we examined the prophetic words spoken to Mary when Jesus was a baby by a man named Simeon. He said, this child is destined to make many fall and many rise in Israel. He will expose the secret thoughts of many hearts. And he looked at Mary and he said, for you, your very soul will be pierced by a sword. And see, Mary's already felt the tip of that sword on these conversations. But she's going to see that sword run her through. She is going to be there and watch her son die the most gruesome and horrific death on a cross. And remember, she doesn't know how this thing's going to play out. She's standing by, powerless to stop the unimaginable. And just put yourself in her shoes. Think how hard it is to watch our children suffer. As a mother, I think we feel it worse than them. And none of us can understand the degree to which Mary watched her child suffer. But when our kids go through painful seasons and we can't stop it, maybe it about kills us. Maybe they're getting bullied or they're suffering from a sickness or an injury or as an adult, they're filed, fired from a job or they're going through a messy divorce and we feel helpless in their battle. We feel that sword pierce our soul. What do we do with that? 
Let's see what we learn from Mary in this moment. In the midst of Jesus' trauma, Mary is there. She is present in his darkest hour. She couldn't control it. She couldn't stop what was happening, but she could be there. And she was there. She shows us what role to play when our children, or really anyone, close to us suffers and we can't help them. We can be there. We can show up for them. We can support them. We can go to that funeral because our loved one is hurting. We can send that card. We can take them a meal. We can make the phone call even though we're not sure what to say. We're just letting them know we're here. When they get that diagnosis, we can pray for them. We can be there. We can go to the doctor with them. We can be there in any way that we can. In John 19, 25, the Bible says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. She was near. And I want to take a moment to talk about a painful battle that our family is fighting right now. My husband, Reese, his dad, we call him Pops. He's my kid's grandfather. He's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he was diagnosed this past summer. And we're in a battle. I mean, we're fighting. We're fighting a battle. My husband's in a battle. And he's been fighting this battle. And my father-in-law going to chemo, going to radiation. We're praying. We're doing all we know to do. So this is really personal. Reese is grieving along with all of his siblings. We can't stop the cancer, but we decided we can be here. And so Reese, my husband, came up with a mantra that our family is saying this summer. He said, we're going to be brave, we're going to pray, and we're going to have fun together. These are some things we can control. So we made this a priority. In the midst of this dark hour, we're there and we're intentional more than ever. We canceled our summer plans and we all went to the lake and did a family reunion. Reese took his dad on that hunting trip that he was supposed to be later, but he went ahead and took him early. We see him daily. They alternate who sits with them, all the siblings, for chemo treatments at the doctor. He knows that we're there. He knows that we're there for him. And I want to say, too, that Pops is a believer. And ultimately, we're all going to be together in eternity. And that's what brings us so close. And really, that's what the good fight's all about. That's why we're all sitting here. This life is a minute. I mean, we're just here for a second. We want to know that in eternity, we're all going to be together. And we have that comfort that this life is not the end. And so any battle that we face here, it has a good ending. Because of what Jesus did on that cross, we don't grieve like people who have no hope. We have hope in Christ. But here on earth, while we're here, our presence matters. It matters to people in the battles. We want to show up for people. Mary was there. His mother's sister was there, the Bible says. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was there. And Mary Magdalene at the Bible. And when Jesus saw his mother there, I love that line, he saw her. You know when your kids are in a program at school or they're doing a sporting event? What do they do? They just scan the crowd and see, until they see you. And then they see you and then it brings them peace. It brings them comfort. There's just something about Jesus. He saw her. He saw her there. And he saw the disciple whom he loved, which was John. That's what he called him, standing nearby. And he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time, John, the disciple, took Mary into his home. And I want to unpack what's happening here. Jesus is on the cross at the peak of his suffering, suffocating. He probably doesn't even have the strength to say the words. He is beaten unimaginable. And yet he has the wherewithal in that moment to take care of his mother in these last hours before it is finished. And I just want to get a visual of this. His arms are nailed to that cross, so he can't point. So she's close enough that, that he can nod with his head, here's your mother, here's your son. He's close enough just to make eye contact. And I thought it was interesting that Jesus doesn't instruct one of his siblings to take care of his mother. He, he has the disciple, John. And his brothers are not mentioned being present at the crucifixion. They probably didn't believe at this point. They don't, and they're afraid. And as the oldest son in the family, this was Jesus' cultural role in the Jewish faith to determine his mother's care. It was the role of the firstborn son. So he's, he's taking care of her. He's tying up all these loose ends. He's taking care of every detail. And he selects John for the role, and it's symbolic. He selects a believer over immediate family. This exchange represents Jesus transferring Mary into the family of God. Yes, she was his mother, but she too had to be born again by the Spirit in order to be saved, just like everybody else. John 3, 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Mary gave birth to Jesus, and he is going to rebirth her into the family of God in this moment. And we see this continue to play out in Acts chapter 1. Mary is mentioned being in the upper room with the disciples, awaiting the coming Spirit. 
She wants to be filled with the Spirit. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. They're in the upper room waiting in Acts 1, 12 through 14. The Bible says, Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Jesus ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. Now they're coming back to the upper room. And they were all staying there, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James, all in one accord, devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, Mary the mother of Jesus, and I love this, and his brothers. At this point, his brothers now believe. We know that Jesus appeared to James. We don't know if he appeared to the other ones. The Bible doesn't say. But now they believe. And I love how this comes full circle. His family is in the upper room waiting to be born again. They're all going to be transferred into the family of God. And the good fight of faith involves us asking ourselves, have we been transferred in the family of God? Have we been born again? Yes, maybe your parents are saved or you've been to church or you go to Bible studies, but have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you said, Lord, I am your servant? Let my life be as you say. That's the good fight. That's when you're filled with his spirit. Do we see him as our savior? In Acts chapter 2, the spirit comes. It's called the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends on all the disciples. They are now filled. And that's where we live today. We live in the age of the spirit. We have access to the Holy Spirit. Mary was there for it all. She gave it her all. She fought the fight well. She can look back and see God's hand in her mission, and have a better understanding as she looks back. But in the process, she trusted God. She trusted His plans. She appreciated the gravity of her mission. She was obedient until the very end, always present, always available, always trusting. It reminds me, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, of the Apostle Paul's words, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I kept the faith. She's an example of that. The good fight involves being present emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And Mary was present in all of these forms in the good fight of faith, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So as we close today, I want to remind all of us, God has a good fight marked out for you. And these women that we've learned about in the Bible, they're examples to us today. Deborah, Miriam, Ruth, Mary, and there's so many more. They fought the good fight well. And I pray today that we will continue to fight the battles that matter to God, and that we will make a difference here on earth for his kingdom. Thank you, guys.